This video is brought to you by channel partner, four years running, Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them, as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, you did it. You made it. Ten years ago, Starfield was little more than a twinkle in Todd's eyes. Five years ago, it was no more than a logo. But this past week, actual human beings have been playing it on their actual Xboxes and their actual PCs. Were you among them? Did you fork out the big dosh to play early access or are you holding off for the weekend? Maybe you couldn't play it because you're on Team Blue. Well, don't worry. I've got something you could spend your money on because the only thing bigger than Starfield this week is that PS Plus price hike. My God, did you see? that jesus christ we'll get to that and more but for now let's take a look at how one of the most hyped games of this generation landed or took off or you know what i mean here comes the news have you been to infinity and or beyond this past weekend if you answered yes it means you're willing to cough up 100 big ones to play starfield that little bit early since the game officially releases on the 6th where it will be on game pass for both xbox and pc despite this limited more expensive release starfield is already huge we of course don't have numbers for people playing on xbox or pc through the microsoft store but on steam alone the game is already peaked at 245,000 concurrent players players and that number will no doubt be dwarfed by the number of people checking it out on game pass this coming weekend there was never any doubt that starfield would be absolutely massive and these numbers are confirmation of that already so what about them critics what did they think well, it's funny because 94 percent of critics recommend it and the game sits at a mighty 88 on open critic which is a slam dunk for Todd and Uncle Phil, but the discourse surrounding the reviews is very centered on the reviews from three major publications, IGN, GameSpot, and PC Gamer, all of which scored the game 7 or 75 in the case of PC Gamer. There's always going to be outlier reviews. I am a walking, talking testament to that, but I think the biggest takeaway is that most people who reviewed Starfield really, really loved it. They comment that the scale of the game is bigger than their wildest imaginings, that the gunplay is surprisingly solid, and the main quest is so okay, but the side content is often exceptional, as is often the way with most Bethesda releases. Crucially, the game delivers on that sense of freedom that is inherent in anything with that Bethesda Game Studios logo on it. You can build settlements, run drugs, become a bounty hunter, a smooth talking diplomat. You can become Batman, basically. There's literally a side quest for that. One consistent piece of commentary comes through that the game starts kind of slow, and in fact, more than a few reviewers commented that those opening hours kind of sucked. But after that, the game really opened up and it gets its hooks into you and at that point it becomes the sort of game that's going to make your average Bethesda fan very happy indeed and likely create a whole new generation of Bethesda fans. Of course, there are some points of criticism. Inventory management and UI appear to be just as bad as in every other Bethesda Studios game, but the models will tidy that up. What they can't fix is the way the game handles exploration and space travel, which is a lot less immersive than people had imagined since it's largely driven by fast travel rather than, you know, flying your tin can through space. That's proved to be a deal breaker for some, a minor issue for others. But that issue aside, most of the chatter I'm seeing about the game on Reddit, on Twitter and elsewhere is really really positive and only getting more positive as people push past those awkward opening hours. It's almost all good news and it makes me really excited to get stuck into it after I'm done with Baldur's Gate 3. I'm now nearing the end of Act 3 in that game, 120 hours deep. So yes, it has kept me very busy. Next week, I'll be in the US for some secret stuff I can't talk about. And after that, it's Cyberpunk. I've cleared the decks for that. I'm super excited to do a full playthrough, seeing how much the game and all its systems have evolved since launch. Starfield is my end of September treat. And based on these reviews, it's gonna cap off one hell of a month. Perhaps the biggest surprise and relief when it comes to Starfield is that it's meant to be in pretty good shape, technically speaking. I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you how these things can often go when Bethesda Game Studios is involved. And it was a key point of anxiety in the lead up to launch since no one other than a single IGN employee was able to play the game prior to the review window. Luckily, Starfield is the most polished Bethesda games release ever. On the performance side, the Digital Foundry review is, as always, the best breakdown you'll find. They comment that the level of visual fidelity present is a significant step up for Bethesda, with internal spaces looking more detailed than ever before. I have to echo that. I did boot it up just to play through the opening bit, and I was immediately struck by how good it looked, with the art design and attention to detail creating some really immersive spaces that, frankly, blew me away. The game looks a hell of a lot better in the flesh than it did in any of those trailers. 
On the Xbox, that target 30 FPS is disappointing for some, but it would have been a lot more disappointing if the game couldn't maintain it. Luckily, it does, holding a steady 30 with only the most minor of occasional dips when the action is thick. PC performance is meant to be pretty solid as well, though that will of course depend on your hardware. And there are reports that AMD GPUs run the game more efficiently, which is a little unsurprising given that Bethesda did enter into a partnership with AMD for this one. That meant that the game shipped without DLSS, but luckily modders have already come to the rescue. You can now download a DLSS mod from Nexus Mods, and it's meant to provide a decent performance boost, just as DLSS always does. Most impressive and surprising of all, Starfield is not a nest of bugs and glitches like oh so many Bethesda titles before it. It's not perfect, not that anyone expected it to be, but most reviews comment that it's a big improvement versus every prior Bethesda release, with very few bugs spoiling your fun. You will likely run into a few, sure, just as you would with any systemically driven open world game, but chances are they're going to be minor inconveniences rather than persistent distractions or game-breaking catastrophes. It's a great result that has Bethesda feeling positively chipper and perhaps hopeful that it might help us forget or at least misremember the good old days. Bethesda's head of publishing Pete Hines took an interview with GamesIndustry.biz this week and he was quizzed about Bethesda's history of janky releases. He responded, quote, The thing people miss far too often is that there is some amount of that which is intentional, meaning we embrace the chaos. We could make a safer, less buggy, less risky game if we wanted to. But what we try to lean into is player freedom. Yes, there's going to be some little things here and there where your companion might stand a little too close to you sometimes. Yet the freedom you get and the things that happen because of that, we absolutely love and embrace. Of course there are bugs, but does it take away from your experience? Or do you have a consistent, fun game that you just can't stop playing and experimenting with? End quote. That is a great quote, and he is so right. When I think about Fallout 76, the first thing I think is, it would have been such a great game if it weren't for those damn NPCs who were standing so close to me all the time. That was the problem. That is why only 8% of critics recommended it. That is why the Australian government took Bethesda to court and forced them to issue refunds to Australian citizens. The NPCs just weren't respecting our personal space. Look, I'm as happy as the next person that Starfield is a good game in solid technical shape, but let's not use the victory lap as a chance to rewrite history. The NPC standing slightly too close to you is one hell of a way to characterize Bethesda's long and well-documented history of buggy releases and re-releases. That's a lot of Vaseline on the lens. And with things going as well as they are, this hardly seems the time for Bethesda's head of publishing to admit that they could have shipped less buggy games, but simply chose not to. We saw some of that decision-making earlier this year when Bethesda published Redfall, a game that would go on to become the second lowest rated major release of the year after Golem. The developer Arcane Studios said prior to release that Redfall would be their most supported game ever, but the catastrophic release led many, myself included, to suggest that it's probably better to just cut your losses and move on to the next thing. Bethesda does not agree, apparently. Speaking in the same interview, Pete Hines said, quote, we don't like failing to meet player expectations. At the same time, we are the same company that has had launches that didn't go the way we wanted and we didn't quit or abandon stuff just because it didn't start right, end quote. He references the work that's gone into both The Elder Scrolls Online and Fallout 76 before saying, quote, Redfall is no different for us. Okay, we didn't get the start we wanted, but it's still a fun game. Hmm. And we're going to keep working on it. We're going to do 60 FPS. We're going to get it to be a good game because we know, as a first party studio, Game Pass lives forever. There will be people 10 years from now who are going to join Game Pass and Redfall will be there, end quote. While Heinz does commit to a 60 FPS update, he's not specific about what we can expect after that. The amount of work required to get Redfall to this elusive good game status is huge, and unlike Elder Scrolls or Fallout, Redfall doesn't have the sort of dedicated fandom who might cheer it on from the sidelines. Redfall is averaging a concurrent player count of 30 on Steam at the moment. You have to wonder how much stomach Microsoft might have for the price tag required to see that number go up, when there are so many other safer bets they could be making with those dollars. Bets like The Elder Scrolls 6, Jeez, we're really ticking every Bethesda box this week, aren't we? Speaking in a different interview with Spanish publication Vandal, Pete Hines confirmed that The Elder Scrolls 6 is now officially out of pre-production and in early development. He was clear to contain expectations on the timeline though, saying, quote, So no, don't expect to hear anything about The Elder Scrolls 6 anytime soon. For now, Starfield is our focus and it will continue to be our priority for some time until we speak about anything else, end quote. 
During Starfield's development, Todd Howard did say that many of the engine improvements and new technology they were deploying would go towards the next Elder Scrolls game, which would surely speed up development time at least a little bit. But let's not forget that your average AAA game is around five to six years to make at this point, and Bethesda have never been known for a speedy development timeline. It's not inconceivable to imagine Elder Scrolls 6 arriving in 2028 or later. That is the future, ladies and gentlemen. We are gonna be all running around on hoverboards by that time. By the way, do you guys see that power wash simulator thing they're doing with Back to the Future where you can wash the DeLorean? That is very cool. Personally, I hope we get a mission to wash the manure off Biff's car, but I'd settle for the time machine. Team Green are riding high right now on the back of Starfield's critical and commercial success. So you can assume that Sony would be ready with the appropriate counterpunch, the fancy footwork that keeps them top of mind and reminds everyone that PlayStation is the single best place to play your game. Sure enough, Sony did not disappoint. And that is why this month, they've got a PS Plus headline act that you would not believe. Are you ready? It's Saints Row. I told you you wouldn't believe it. Oh, and also PS Plus costs 35% more now. Yes, that's right. Announced at roughly the same time as Starfield's review embargo. Very clever, Jim. Sony revealed that their PS Plus programs were getting a price bump. Okay, not unexpected. I mean, Game Pass got a price bump recently, one to $2, depending on your region. Keep in line with inflation, which is tracking at around 9% globally. It makes sense, sort of. Sony's price bump, 20 more US dollars every year for the base edition, 35 more US dollars per year for the extra tier, and 40 more US dollars per year for premium tier. Sony's justification? Fuck you, pay me. For real, they didn't offer any proper explanation other than this generic statement. Quote, this price adjustment will enable us to continue bringing high quality games and value added benefits to your PlayStation Plus subscription service, end quote. This is a really, really, really weird move. It's a significant price hike without any corresponding increase in value. If they were to come out and say, hey, we're adding uh, this game and we're remaking Bloodborne and we're rebooting Soul Reaver, I'd be like, sure, sign me up, whatever, take all my money. But to jack the price this much without anything new, without any explanation, and when Saints Row is your headline offering, I mean, come on, man, this is a very head-scratching announcement that harkens back to the aloofness and hubris of the PS3 era. There are rumors from Jeff Grubb that a PlayStation showcase is now planned connected to this event. That had better be a damn good showcase because because PlayStation fans are not happy. You know who else isn't happy? The Nanny. That's right, Fran Drescher, the one with the voice. She used to use that voice to win the heart of Mr. Sheffield, but now she's using it as the president of the Screen Actors Guild, who are in the midst of a months long strike where they try to guarantee better working conditions for writers and actors. This week, the strike took a whole new turn when the Guild authorized a membership vote to strike against video game companies, including the likes of Electronic Arts, Epic Games, Insomniac Games, Take Two, and Warner Brothers. The Guild says it's reached a stalemate in its negotiations with industry as they pursue an 11% increase in wages for performers, people like voice actors and those who do motion cap, etc., as well as protections from AI, which risks having a ruinous impact on the lives of voice actors in particular. The industry is holding out, but did I mention that EA CEO Andrew Wilson takes home $20 million a year plus a bonus? Did I mention that Take-Two CEO Strauss Zelnick doubled his pay last year to $42 million a year? Did I mention that Bobby Kotick took home $154 million in 2021? These are the people who don't want voice actors to get an 11% bump and refuse to guarantee that they won't be replaced by robots in five years. I wish the guild well. I hope they get every one of their demands and more. It's an important fight because jobs in the video games industry are becoming less and less secure. And this week was a perfect example of that because we saw a raft of downsizing and two studios closed their doors. On the downsizing front, Riot is currently cutting jobs across different parts of their business. This this week, the game director for League of Legends mobile spin-off Wild Rift was let go. Jared Burback made the announcement on Twitter, one of the more high-profile exits as Riot continues to adjust to the declining esports scene. Blackbird Interactive also announced cuts. They recently released Minecraft Legends and are currently hard at work on Homeworld 3, but that didn't stop them from letting 40 people go across a variety of disciplines. The cuts come after a number of projects were cancelled, though we don't know what those projects were or why they were cancelled. It's often a mystery how all this stuff goes down, and such is the case here. It's less a mystery in the the case of Volition, who this week announced that after some 30 years on the map, they were closing their doors. Volition are most recently known for the Saints Row series, but in the late 90s and early 2000s, they were doing Free Space and Summoner before moving on to the seminal Red Faction, a game that to this day still does environmental destruction better than 95% of other games. The Saints Row series kicked off in 2006, becoming increasingly zanier with each installment. It reached a point with the fourth game where a reboot felt like the right thing to do, and it was, only it did not go well. 2022 Saints Row 
Euro was just abysmal by almost every metric, and Embracer Group financial reporting indicated that the game sold well below expectations. Volition were then brought under the Gearbox publishing umbrella, which felt like a stay of execution until the axe fell this week with the announcement that the studio would be shuttered and all staff let go. Obviously, part of this is explainable by the poor reception to Saints Row, but it's equally explainable by the recent collapse of a multi-billion dollar deal that Embracer's leadership were negotiating with Saudi Arabian investment funds. The collapse of that deal led Embracer to announce a company-wide restructuring and cost-saving program. Volition's closure is a part of that. Very sad to see any studio as long-standing and storied as this tapping out. Hopefully all of the affected staff land new roles soon. There was one final closure separate to all of that, and it was Mimi Me Studios, who had earlier released both Shadow Tactics, Blades of the Shogun, and Desperados 3. And just last month, they released a new game called Shadow Gambit The Cursed Crew. That was a critical success that's currently sitting at overwhelmingly positive on Steam. But sales-wise, it's hard to get a read since it's a very niche sort of game. After 15 years in business, the studio announced this week that they were closing their doors, saying they wanted to focus on themselves and theirs. Quote, After the release of Shadow Gambit, we decided it was the right time to prioritize our well-being and to pull the brakes instead of signing up for another multi-year production cycle. End quote. Tough time to be working in video games, it seems, and it sadly doesn't look like it's going to get any easier anytime soon. A quick lightning round to finish off. Baldur's Gate 3 may be getting the DLC that we are all thirsting for, and I use that term very deliberately. If you know, you know. Speaking of IGN, Larry and senior product manager Tom Butler said, quote, We'll carry on patching for a while, and then we're going to take a holiday, and then we'll figure out what we do next. But at the moment, we genuinely have discussions. We want to do more. We don't know what yet, end quote. It's hardly confirmation, but given the scale of the game's success and how much people are clamoring for more of it, I wouldn't be at all surprised if Larian gave us what we wanted. The day before. Ah, remember that one? Yeah, you do. I'm not saying the game's a scam because I don't want to get sued, but lots of other people are saying it's a scam and who am I to disagree? The game promised the absolute world in its initial reveal, and each time we've seen it since, it's promised less and less. The game has been mired in legal trouble owing to a copyright dispute over the name, which was snatched up by someone in Korea and they're refusing to hand it over. The developers are still fighting to keep that name, but just in case they fail, they've trademarked a new title. Spotted by wellplayed.com.au, the day before may soon be known as Day World. Whatever the fuck that means. The funniest thing about this story is that this title is already a series of sci-fi books published by Penguin. It would be so funny if this developer went from one copyrighted name to another. By funny, I mean totally unsurprising, and I bet that's exactly what happened. Final Fantasy 16 is getting some small but appreciated updates. A new patch brings some new character outfits and the ability to transmog Clive's sword. Not bad. More importantly, the game's producer, Yoshi P, announced that a PC port is on the way. Development has begun, no date for when it might be finished. And word on the street is that it won't be an Epic exclusive, which is great because no one likes Epic exclusives. To cap all of that off, Yoshi P also confirmed that two paid DLCs are in development. That is interesting for story reasons. I won't spoil, but it's going to be exciting to see which direction Square takes this universe. While I didn't love 16, I think its world had so much potential, and I'd really love to see the DLC tell some different stories in that universe, but that's just me. Lenovo are going head to head with both Valve and Nintendo. Man, that takes some serious cojones. They've just announced a handheld PC that'll compete with Valve's excellent Steam Deck and the very decent Asus ROG Ally. The Nintendo angle comes in when you look at the unit's design, which sports detachable controllers just like El Switcherino. Fun fact, the right controller becomes a mouse when you hold it upright and slide it around on a desk, which is pretty rad to be honest. It's hitting in November, I've reached out to Lenovo to get my hands on a review unit, so hopefully I can bring you some coverage on that one soon, since I do love me some handheld PCs. Speaking of hardware, good night, sweet prince, for Microsoft has officially ended production of the Kinect. This is sort of a technicality since the Kinect we all know and made fun of was discontinued some time ago. But since then, Microsoft have been making different versions of it targeting enterprise clients. Even that is now done. The last of Don Matrick's legacy receding like waves from a shoreline. As sad as that is, we'll always have this moment. You ever wonder what the bottom of an Avatar shoe looks like? Well, bam, there it is. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, Wolong Fallen Dynasty is getting some DLC on September 27th. It's called Conqueror of Zhandong and Team Ninja confirmed its existence this week on Twitter. They were rather tight-lipped about what the DLC entails, so I guess stay tuned for more details soon. New World is getting its first expansion in Rise of the Angry Earth, arriving on October 3rd for 30 US dollars. New World, man, that was the hell of a ride, wasn't it? It launched to a peak concurrent player count of 913,000 people, making it one of the most successful 
PC launches in history, but in just a few short months it lost basically its entire player population owing to issues with the endgame loop and economy. Right now the game still averages some 20,000 peak concurrent players a day, which is still a very respectable number, don't get me wrong, but it's a shadow of its former self, and no doubt Amazon are hopeful that this expansion will bring a chunk of those players back. The expansion adds new story, mounts, a new level cap, a new gear rarity tier, a new weapon type, and much more, and it also drops at the same time as their Season 3 update, since every game has seasons now it seems. We'll check out the reviews for this one after it drops, because I'm genuinely interested to see how much this expansion moves the needle and gets people logging in again. Devolver Digital's next big thing, or rather small thing, now has an official release date. Gumbrella is a charming 2D action platformer that feels absolutely amazing to play. For real, I booted it up a while ago when they sent me a build and the controls were just fantastic and the aesthetic was great. It's classic Devolver. They know how to pick winners, they rarely miss, and this one looks like it's on its way to being yet another indie darling. It's arriving on September 13th, exclusive to the PC. PC and Switch for now, got to assume that other consoles will happen later. Those looking for a CRPG hit after Baldur's Gate 3 may want to check out the recently announced new Ark line. It's from developer Dream 8 and it has a lot of Arcanum energy, at least visually. No specific date for this one yet, but it is scheduled for sometime in 2024. All right, here's a big surprise. Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 is still a video game that exists and is in development. If you haven't been keeping up with this one, it's been stuck in development hell for about as long as vampires live, to the point where Paradox, the game's publisher, fired the game's creative director and lead narrative designer, before then going on to yank the whole project from the developer, Hardsuit Labs. Paradox insisted that the game was still coming at some point, but we were all super skeptical since Paradox was unwilling to announce a new developer. Well, they did that this week, a studio by the name of The Chinese Room are taking over. They're the studio behind Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, and now they're making a first-person vampire immersive sim action RPG. Best of British luck to them. They're based in Britain, by the way, so I'm allowed to say that. Bitches leave. <coughs> Try that again. <laughs> Bitches leave. Sorry, I have to say that every time Robocop comes up. It's a tick. I'm working on it. Robocop Rogue City was initially planned to drop sometime in September, but was quietly delayed this week. It'll now launch on November 2nd, which is a strong choice, I think, since most of the year's biggest stuff will have released by that point. So this gives the game a nice clear runway. The initial reveal was a little jarring, but the more recent gameplay showcases were more encouraging. I'm still not 100% sold on how this might work though. Kind of looks like a game that would be best played with a light gun in hand, which makes me very sad that they don't make those anymore. Can you imagine how good a reboot of Time Crisis would be in 2023? I would play the shit out of that. Anyway, Robocop, 2nd of November, as the world's leading Robocop influencer, I will be there. You guys remember the Rugrats? If you answered yes, you are old. Have you taken your pills today? Do you know where you are? Do you have someone we can call? I got something that'll help you while away those hours in the nursing home, Rugrats Adventure in Gameland. It's a retro inspired 2D platformer that allows you to toggle between 16-bit pixels and full HD art. It is a nice touch. I like what they're doing here. I'm a sucker for anything with Reptar in it. So I'll check this out when it drops sometime in 2024 for PC and consoles. Finally, one game was shut down this week and it was from, wouldn't you know it, Square Enix. They've shuttered a bunch of live services over the past 18 months and this week they announced that Sino Alice would be decommissioned on November 15th. This game was directed by none other than Yoko Taro, creator of the Nier franchise. Only it was a mobile exclusive, which means you probably didn't hear about it. It was okay. I played it for a bit, hoping that it might have some of that Taro magic, but it was kind of this weird story-driven gacha game that never really got going. It didn't do well with critics and evidently it wasn't making money for Square, so it will now walk the plank. We eagerly await the next big budget release from Yoko Taro. I feel like we should be due to hear something from him very soon since Neo Automata was a long time ago now, right? Hopefully we see his creepy moon mask again real soon. So what came out last week? Well, obviously Starfield, but we've more than covered that one off already. Outside of that, not a lot. A deliberately quiet week as most publishers were keen to stay out of Starfield's mammoth wake. Trine 5 was unafraid though. It launched on all platforms to decent reviews. It's 96 very positive on Steam with around 200 reviews counted. Critics seem to enjoy it as well, putting it a strong 79 on Open Critic. IGN scored it an eight, meaning it's better than Starfield. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. That is not how review scores work. Please put your pitchforks down. IGN said of it, quote, Try and Five, a Clockwork Conspiracy sequel, is a superb puzzle platformer that sticks close to the series' playbook, end quote. Most of the other reviews say something similar. TLDR, if you like Trine, this is more Trine. 
that you're probably going to like this. The other release last week was Chance of Sanaa, and if the buzz is at least half right on this one, then it's meant to be pretty special indeed. No Steam reviews for this one yet, but critics put it at a strong 80 on Open Critic. It definitely struck a nerve with some. Jason Schreier of Bloomberg said of it, quote, A week ago, I had never heard of this game. Now it's one of my favorites of the year. It's called Chance of Sanaa, and it's a beautiful, haunting logic puzzle reminiscent of Obra Dinn. Took me around 10 hours to finish. It's out today, and you should play it, end quote. While Steven Totillo of Axios said something similar, quote, Tears of the Kingdom aside, my other favorite game of 2023 is one you've probably not heard of. A beautiful, brilliant puzzle adventure about translating languages. This year's Obra Dinn or Golden Idol, end quote. So yeah, that was the week that was. What about the week that cometh? Well, Starfield officially releases today. A reminder that that is available on Game Pass for both PC and consoles. Game Pass has its detractors, but it's very hard to argue with value like that. If you prefer your plastic in blue, then good news. The best game of 2023 launches on your console today. Baldur's Gate 3 arrives for PS5 after launching on PC last month. It's... Look, I don't know what to say about it right now. It's just... It's, 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 it's the best. It's, it's, it's the best, okay? I'll find some proper words for it soon, but it's, it's just the best. Anyway, here's something interesting. Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis launches on mobile devices tomorrow. Now, look, this is a mobile title, sure, but it's actually a pretty ambitious one. It's essentially a retelling of the entire Final Fantasy VII saga, including the spin-off entries. Stuff like the film, Advent Children, or Crisis Core. Hell, even Dirge of Cerberus gets a look in. Visually, the game is very impressive. The presentation factor is well above what I was expecting. I know, because I actually played it when I was in LA earlier this year at Summer Games Fest. I played through the entire opening section and the reactor, culminating in the Scorpion Sentinel boss battle. I was really impressed. I truly was. At the same time, this is a mobile game propped up by loot boxes as your character progression is tied to weapons and armor that you can earn but you'll probably have to pay for unless you want to have a really bad time like most mobile games a lot of it will depend on that in-game spending but i do think it's worth at least taking a look at this one i think most people will be surprised at how well square have managed to capture and distill the final fantasy 7 experience and i can see myself putting at least some time into this so long as the in-game spending isn't a total catastrophe, which let's be real, it probably will be. There's a rugby game coming out on all platforms by the Switch on the 7th. NBA 2K24 comes out on the 8th. We don't do sports ball around here, so moving right along to Eternites, which launches on the PC and PS5 on the 12th. Here's the blurb from Steam, quote, Eternites is a dating action game where you try to make the most out of life during the apocalypse. Monday, go on a date. Tuesday, clear dungeon. Friday, freak out the clock is ticking end quote these anime games they've always got some teenagers out to save the world the fate of the universe hangs in the balance but they've always got time to go on dates with their waifus it's so ridiculous so immature not my thing anyway i'm gonna go play Baldur's gate 3 for another 50 hours i'll see you guys soon hey i'm back that was fast time flies when you're having your mind blown <laughs> hey put this on your radar <laughs> This week, more than a few people sent me this one after it started doing the rounds on Twitter. It's called Holston, and it's from a developer by the name of Sonka. They have a number of games under their belt going back as far as 2017, but this is definitely their most interesting and ambitious. It's a 3D pixel art survival horror game that moves seamlessly from isometric perspective to over-the-shoulder third-person shooter. I don't think I've ever seen a game do that before. I'm not sure how jarring it might be to actually play that, but the trailers make it look pretty good, so I'm at least interested. The pixel art is also top notch. I'm not sure if it actually is pixel art or if it's sort of simulated to look that way. Either way, it's got a clear sense of style that pops in every frame. It describes itself as a psychological horror set in an eerie, isolated Polish town consumed by an ominous presence. So basically every survival horror game ever. But hey, there's a reason developers keep coming back to that setup. It works. I think this looks super interesting. I'm keen to check this out. And if you are too, then be sure to wishlist this title as it always helps out developers in a big way. I profiled it over on my Steam creator page, which also has links to all of the other put this on your radar stuff I've recently covered. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and it's a quick canter to the finish line. Not a lot to shout out this week, despite it being the first week of the month. Epic still have Cave Story up there, but later this week, it'll be replaced by Spell Drifter, which I haven't played, but it's a turn-based deck builder with a focus on positioning on a grid-like map. It was released back in February, 
February of last year, mostly positive, 72% on Steam. We've already discussed the PS Plus Headline Act, Saints Row 2022, but in addition to that, there are two more offerings. The first is Black Desert Traveler Edition, which is the MMORPG Black Desert, with a whole bunch of expansion updates attached to it. The other offering is Generation Zero, and you know what? This is actually worth checking out, I think. I played it way back in the day when it was extremely bare bones, definitely couldn't have recommended it back then. Since then, the game has received dozens and dozens of updates, and when I went back to it about two months ago, I found it much more fleshed out and compelling. It's a survival game, but it's focused on solo or co-op play rather than big servers. It's narratively driven rather than being just a big sandbox, and it has a really unique grounded setting, that of Sweden during the Cold War era. I know there are lots of big hitters out at the moment, but just add this one to your library, come back to it at some point, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Finally, there's Game Pass. It's, uh, it's got Starfield, not bad, but hey, don't sleep on the other two entries. Solar Ash is from Heart Machine, the developer behind Hyperlight Drifter. Some truly stunning visuals and a brilliant flow state game if you're into that sort of thing. Incoming sleeper hit warning, Lies of P launches on Game Pass on day one when it drops on the 19th. This already has some buzz behind it owing to an excellent demo. It's Bloodborne if FromSoft dared to make a sequel. Will it be as good as that? Probably not, but if it comes even close to it, then we're in for a damn good time. Okay, the show's running really long, so our feel-good story for the week has to be short. Check out this torch that someone found in Starfield. I was, of course, being a little loose with the truth. This torch was not found, but rather made by a modder. To this person, I would ask one question. Why the fuck did you make a torch that projects an image of Phil Spencer's face? I mean, I'm into it, don't get me wrong, but I really want to know what was going through your head when you decided that this was the mod that Starfield needed most. If you're watching, please let me know in the comment section below. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the show. September is, I'll tell you right now, massive. We have 15 videos planned for the month. Many I can't talk about yet as their secret source. That's what my trip to LA is about next week. But many of them I can talk about. I'm going to review Baldur's Gate 3 very soon. Austin is wrapping up his review of the latest Guild Wars expansion while also giving an overview of the state of Guild Wars in 2023. Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty is coming and you better believe I'm going to review that. Lies of P is also on the way and Austin's on that one. And at the end of the month, I'm going to lock down that Starfield review ahead of an absolutely massive October. That is a lot of content and I'm very excited for all of it. So I hope you'll join me by clicking that subscribe button and ideally digging that notification bell. If you liked this video, then please do drop it a like. That is super helpful and helps the video reach more people through YouTube's fickle algorithm. Thank you again for stopping by and a big thank you to this week's sponsor, Squarespace. One question I often get is how to break into the world of content creation. There's a lot of ways to do it. Streaming, community building, YouTube, games, media, many ways to cut your teeth. Obviously, my stuff eventually ends up on YouTube, but what if YouTube wasn't the right fit for you? What if you wanted to build your own independent gaming outlet or blog, allowing you to talk about games how you like, building a portfolio of work as you did so that you could one day leverage into different opportunities? Well, if you're just starting out, then could I suggest Squarespace? Squarespace lets you build professional looking websites in minutes. You just select from their extensive list of pre-built templates, customize those templates to your desire and boom, you are in business. It really is that easy. Squarespace intuitive tools and huge library of templates make it super easy to get started. If you can handle formatting a Word document or a PowerPoint slide, then you are already well and truly equipped to make a fantastic looking website through Squarespace. Once it's live and your content starts going up, Squarespace has all sorts of backend tools to help you track and grow your site. Detailed analytics tools showcase what your audience is clicking on and SEO tools and social media integration make it easier for your audience to find you. It's a simple end-to-end -end solution that could be the start of your content creation journey if the written word is what interests you. If it is and you want to get started, then visit squarespace.com to start building your website through their free trial. And if you want to get serious, then use offer code SKILLUP for 10% off your purchase of a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.